On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse Q&A, we talk with psychotherapist Katie Gillis about recognizing what a smear campaign looks like and the common tactics that are used. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse Q&A, everyone. I am Brandon Chadwick, and with me today, we have Katie Gillis. How are you? I am good. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you for being here. And if you want to be a guest on our Survivor Story episodes, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page. There you can read all of our instructions and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our guest form and press the submit button. And please do read everything that is there, all the instructions, and send it in the format that we ask for. And today we are talking to Katie Gillis, and we are going to be covering smear campaigns. And if you don't know who Katie Gillis is, Katie is a psychotherapist, author, and consultant with a passion for working with survivors of traumatic relationships, whether familial or romantic. And you have two books. The first one is Invisible Bruises, How a Better Understanding of the Patterns of Domestic Violence Can Help Survivors Navigate the Legal System, and it sheds light on the ways that the legal system can perpetuate the cycle of domestic violence. And your most recent book, which is out today, everyone, is called it's called It's Not High Conflict, It's Post-Separation Abuse. All of the links for these books will be in our show notes. And you also have a blog on Psychology Today called Invisible Bruises. Uh, you've been featured on iHeartRadio, The Dr. Wendy Wall Show, Newsweek, and more. Katie Gillis, thank you so much for being here with us today. We're going to discuss smear campaigns. So I guess start us off with what is a smear campaign? What does this look like? And how does, re- how does this relate to narcissistic abuse and also domestic violence? Absolutely. So uh, a smear campaign uh, in, in recent years, it's become, as we're becoming more um, aware of narcissistic abuse and what that looks like, and we're becoming more aware of how smear campaigns are used um, in narcissistic abuse. But previously, a smear campaign was usually thought of when you, maybe when you were watching politics or things like that, it's where someone um, uses information. And sometimes it, sometimes they're out uh, boldface lies, and sometimes they're just kind of... Um, uh, exaggerations of the truth to discredit a person to ruin their reputation um, and a lot of times it's seen in narcissistic abuse as a way to punish the person as a way to discredit them and as a way to also to to ruin their their reputation and to make um, false or exaggerated claims as a way of kind of you know ruining their story and diminishing their story as a way to make the the person with narcissistic personality disorder the person with narcissistic traits um, kind of get their story out first and, and attempt to be maybe more believed and um, as as a way to be more kind of like having their story front and center. It's a manipulation tactic. So sometimes we hear these things happen after a relationship is yes. over, but this also can occur uh, during a relationship as well. So what are the reasons why it's done during a relationship? So when it happens during a relationship, it's usually done as a way to kind of build the narrative that the the victim or the target is someone who is not to be believed. So usually you'll see the person with narcissistic traits start to say things like, oh, you know, John's been drinking a lot and and I'm really worried about him. He's he's really, you know, doesn't like to like to take care of the kids or, or Susie's, you know, skips a lot of work. She's really unreliable, like little things like that. Sometimes they'll say things like, Oh, I'm really worried about them or, you know, they're spending a lot of money, stuff like that. And it's, it's really done as a way to kind of paint the picture of the other person being flawed or having things that are wrong with them. That way, when the relationship ends, the people in the social circle will say, oh, yeah, well, I, I did hear that, that John was acting that way or Susie was acting that way. Um, it, it usually happens when the person with narcissistic traits uh, believes that they are losing control of 
the relationship or losing um, some kind of control or hold on the other person. That's when it happens during the relationship. In the history of the show, we hear lots of different types of smear campaigns that go on. And one that popped in my head right away uh, in, in a tactic, if I remember correctly, was this person was now living in a town. They were already, they got kind of got isolated already from their friends and family. So they're now in a town where they really don't know that many people. They have some friends, but smearing happened to people within the community. And, you know, when they go out to meet these people in the community, they start to notice that these people are already acting weird toward them and they don't understand what is is really going on and that a wedge is already being built between them making it much more difficult to uh, create close relationships uh, with anyone in in a way further isolating you within that community so you have less people to reach out to so that was like a real interesting one. And then obviously when you, when you stated like later down the road, none of these people are going to believe you because they've been hearing these things step by step. Um, are there any other things kind of within that that like a smear would be used within the relationship that you can think of? So the biggest thing that I always like to tell people is, you know, focus on the word isolation, focus on the concept of isolation and, and those patterns, because what happens is, is the person is trying to make it so the other person or so to the target or the victim um, has fewer resources, whether those are social resources, financial, family, um, employment, anything like that, because you'll see a lot of things like, oh, you know, Johnny can't manage money, so I have to be the one to handle the money, or Susie can't be trusted alone with the children, or things like that. And it's kind of like kind of puts a little bee in the bonnet of of the other people who are around the people in the social group, um, just as a way to isolate them. So that way they don't have the social supports, they don't have the financial supports. And it it does happen on a spectrum. So, you know, I've seen horrible uh smear campaigns that have uh you know, ruined a person's employment or ruined a person's um, ability to be a parent to their children. Um, and then I've seen it maybe on a smaller lens of someone just, you know, blaming the, the spouse for, for drinking when it's not true, things like that. Um, so it, it does happen on a spectrum. I do like to say that. Yeah, as you mentioned, there the smear campaign that goes on within the household as well to the children is a, a yes. huge, huge one. Uh, you know, we ha we had one of the earliest episodes we did was with someone named Louise, and when the relationship was over, the children didn't believe that she was a competent person. They didn't believe anything um, about like who she said she was because they, it was brainwashing essentially. And it took a long time, but the kids started to come around in, in the aftermath after the divorce, because she said, I can't say anything to them. I can only prove things to them. So she ended up, I think, becoming a nutritionist and doing all of these different things. And then all of a sudden they're like, wait one second. Everything we heard was a lie, but in, in, a, yes. in a lot of ways, words can't, words might have been used to uh, smear you, but it takes like, like actual physical proof in like tangible things a lot of the times to change that uh, thing. Words can't combat words in a lot of ways when yes. we're talking about this. It's like, it's like first person to get the words in wins. Yes. And it's absolutely, it's a tactic that's used commonly um, in cults, you know, and anything where one person wants to have um, all the power and control, you'll see a lot of smearing happen um, to really discredit the person, make it so that they, they aren't believed, you know, get, get your story in first, because whoever gets the, the details out first, you know, is the one who's more likely to be believed. So you'll see things like that. And, and it's very common, like with what you said, with the example of the children, with the children being brought into, you know, oh, um, you know, their, their dad's no good, their mom's an alcoholic, like these, these kind of comments, and they reach to the children, they reach to the court system, they reach to, you know, employers, extended family, and things like that. And I, I always like to stress to people that this is much more than just 
you know, bad mouthing someone. This is much more than just, you know, he said, she said. A lot of times people think, oh, okay, so they're talking bad about you. Just ignore them. But th this this is something, this is much more than just um, a, a scorned lover talking bad about someone or, or sharing their feelings about the relationship ending. This This goes deep. This is, you know, affecting people's employment, affecting people's ability to be a parent. Um, legal ramifications. A lot of times there's false, uh, you know, in social services, we see a lot of times uh, false reports to DCFS or or CPS or, or, or things like that, um, just as a way to really tarnish the person. So this is definitely serious. So what are the usual targets and most common tactics used in smear campaigns? So the most common targets, they'll target the things that you love the most. The things are the people who you love the most. So if you have children, children are most common targets. Um, employment is is common. Friends, um, extended family, and things like that. Anything that you that you love the most. Um, false uh, false complaints to uh, D DCFS, CPS are very common. Um, things like that. Anything that that they see that they can harm you the most. Um, so for most people, it is things like employment, things like children. Um, so anyone who kind of plays like the a crucial role in the court, um, you know, it's 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 hard really to have too much one on one time with a judge. But anything with like you know your GAL, um, anyone who's involved, like if you have a mediator, if you have a, um, I'm forgetting what it's called, but the person who comes and kind of sits, kind of like a guard, like a guardian or like a chaperone, if you have to sit with someone with your children, that kind of thing. And anyone can be subjected to a smear, but it's usually the the goal is to affect the relationship with the children. Um, the goal is to affect um, anything that means a lot to the person, like um, employment, things like that, where you know things that they rely on. So the most common tactics used are things like. Um, discrediting them by making making them look bad, saying that they're an alcoholic, saying or, or that they're using drugs, um, saying that they're abusing the children, or saying that they're not there for the children, or that they're not able to care for the children. Those are those are very very common. Um, we see a lot of reports to uh, I keep calling it DCFS, but if it's good. CPS, I think you all know what I'm talking about, like Child and Family Protection Services. Uh, we see a lot of reports um, to. Um, saying that, you know, that they've hit the children or that they have put the children in harm's way, or that they are neglecting the children, things like that. Um, and even though it's it might be unfounded, it might be true, it might not be true. What happens is um, they understand that the authorities have to react to that. You know, if we get a report saying someone is abusing a child, you can't just say, oh, well, they're going through a divorce. I'm going to, you know, dismiss this. Like they know that the authorities have to react to that. Um, so that's a common tactic. Another common tactic is to go after employment. I have a lot of clients who are lawyers or who are in the medical field and they get like, false complaints to their licensing board. They get um, reports to the bar um, to, you know, as a way to kind of like punish them. You know, that's it. You, you left me. You're going to now you lose your license to practice law or medicine. That's pretty common. Um, false uh, calls or complaints to um, employers, uh, things like that, and then extended family. If you have a, you know, a sister or or a mother who you're close to, they're going to try to like really tarnish that relationship and and really affect that support system that you have. And how do you know when a smear campaign is happening to you? So this one. Unfortunately, for many people, um, it, it happens where you kind of hear through the grapevine. Um, it, usually what happens is many of my clients will start to hear things. Um, they'll start to hear, OK, you know, um, I, I'm hearing that you th that you're, you know, you're drinking a lot or I'm hearing that you're, um, you know, abusing the children or things like that. Um, sometimes what will happen is you'll find out because you get a call from uh, child protection services, or you get a call from your employer saying that they had put um, complaints in for your job. You'll get um, a notice from your the, the bar association saying that, that they put in a complaint. Um, things like that is usually how you find out where it's like, I don't want to say too late, but you find out where it's like kind of already a couple steps down the road. You know, the things that start where they start to say, you know, putting the little, um, the, the little bees in the bonnets out there for the people, those, unfortunately, you might not hear because most people don't want to be in the middle. So even if the person is bashing you to your friends, some friends will come and tell you, some friends not. It, it depends on each 
each person in their individual um, perspective of how they want to handle it. But uh, I find that most people are really trying to like stay out of the situation. So usually for everything that you've heard, there's probably 10 or 20 that you haven't heard yet. So I hope that makes sense. And, you know, as I said a little bit earlier, the story that popped in my head was when someone was uh, in town and the people were standoffish under like if someone is standoffish with you and you're and you're you're feeling like something's not right here is it something you should approach the person about like is it something where you're like is there something wrong um did I offend you in some way like is it something that you should engage with if that starts happening or you're feeling like that might be happening or is it something that you should just kind of stay out of the way from so that's an excellent question. And it definitely depends on what it is that's going on and who it is. Like, let's say, for example, that um, you're still in the relationship with the person, but you're kind of moving towards like that breakup stage. You know, we all know that where we're, you know, that stage in the relationship where you're kind of like, OK, we're at the inevitable end. Um, I, if it's your friends, you know, your friends, your your coworkers, and your family who are acting weird, then absolutely say, you know, is there is something that's happened? I sense a little weirdness here. Um, if it's their friends, I might leave it alone. Um, it really depends on your relationship, and and you and we all know, you know, how our relationship is with other people. Are are you comfortable enough with the person where you could say, you know, is, is everything okay? I'm noticing some weirdness with you, and then just know that you might hear something you don't want to hear. Um, I always find that most people will be like, oh, no, everything's okay, because people don't want to get involved. But just be prepared to hear that someone is saying, oh, I, I found out that you, you know, are, are harming the children or neglecting the children or things like that, that are going to make you say, huh, you know, and so just kind of be prepared for that. Um, because what you don't want to get into is like, the point where you're having to defend yourself against lots of lies and allegations because it can it can look weird for two reasons one because it, you know if you if you're sitting there defending all these lies i you can almost look guilty you know because you're you're sitting there trying to do your best to, to defend it it depends on how it's done and the other thing is because it can kind of look like you're playing into that dynamic which is it's really horrible and it feels really victim blaming you know, when I tell people that, like when I work with clients, I'm like, you can't react to it as, as as much. You can't sit there and defend every allegation. You really have to pick your battles. That is very frustrating for many of my clients. They're like, are you kidding me? I have to sit there and like put up with this. And I and I definitely I want to say that I understand that. You know, I relate to that. Because yeah, it will be just like a defensive. You're playing defense. And sometimes when you're playing defense, yes. when it comes to abuse, you might you know, you could raise your voice. You don't, you don't really know exactly how your mannerisms might look. Other people have already heard stories and that you might make like a movement. And then that person who knows who that person is or what type of person they are. And they might say, Oh my God, did you hear about See, he's angry. Susie? See? Susie he's did violent. that. This yeah. person's right. And it reinforces everything that someone might be saying. And sometimes the best thing to do here is just, be quiet because if you're quiet there's no ammunition that can then be used against you to reinforce everything that's going on and you know this can also happen not just with friends and family this can happen with your school teachers yes. uh, educator educators and all of those things so if you're dealing with something like that when it's teachers and you're the you know you're the primary like good caregiver like the frustration that must be going on uh, for someone who's being smeared to a teacher when you're the one doing all of the work, what would you say to those people um, as well? Like, how do you deal with a teacher in that situation? Because you would hope that a teacher would be more understanding. So it really is a type of situation where you have to let someone's behavior speak for themselves. Um, and again, it, it depends on the situation. It depends. I always tell people pick your battles. Like if it has to do with your children or your employment, um, then that's a battle you should pick. If it's just, you know, 
someone nitpicking or um, picking at your character, picking at your personality, then maybe just let that one go. Uh, I understand it's frustrating. I, you know, call your support person, write about it, blast music, whatever you need to do to really work through those feelings. Don't dismiss the feelings, but it, it's hard to get into sticking up for yourself about a personality flaw or a personality issue because then you could you get into the well then well she said this and he said this and then teachers you know no one really wants to kind of be in the middle of that unfortunately because you know it's not fair but um if you're working with a teacher or another professional um stick only to the facts like yes that did happen at 8 45 or no that did not happen at all and that's it don't get into the well she's a liar and and he always says this or that don't don't get into the pointing the fingers back because then it just it'll have like the unfortunate effect of making you you both look vindictive so you really kind of have to let the person's behavior and let the person's um you know lies and actions kind of come out narcissist apocalypse is sponsored by better help Last year, I realized that I had a lot of work to do when it came to my codependency issues, and I really did have a lot of work to do. It was difficult to come to terms with, but at the same time, I knew I would actually be a better person for doing the work. And thankfully, I worked with my BetterHelp therapist to get back to the root of my issues so I could just start working on these things every day because my codependency stuff... I have to work on it every single day. And having the support from my therapist was just so helpful and I'm doing so much better because of it. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, I really just can't recommend therapy enough. So just give BetterHelp a try. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash nap today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash nap. So what does a smear campaign look like to the people on the outside? So to the people who are on the outside, sometimes they really don't know what is going on because it's hard to differentiate, at least in the beginning, it's hard to differentiate what's truth and what is an embellishment, what's an exaggeration and what's just a flat out lie. And most people, like I keep saying, most people like don't care. And I know that that sounds horrible, um, but most people are just kind of like, look, if John and Susie are having a a breakup and they're both talking about each other i don't really want to be involved in that those those are like the category of most people um some people will play into it like some people will say oh really well what did he do okay and then what did he say oh i always knew he was an asshole or i always knew he was a jerk or things like that you know most people will say things like oh you know and then they kind of like fuel the fire um you know and so to to the outside though most of the time it it looks like an angry person or a hurt person. And in the beginning, it's hard for people to differentiate. Okay, well, she, you know, she just seems hurt or she just seems angry. Um, But then what happens is it's going on and on and on. It's not like, okay, we broke up last week. So I'm going through a couple days of, of, bad behavior immature behavior it, it it goes on and on and it's multiple avenues but most people don't see the different avenues you know they might hear you know they might go out to to drinks or to brunch with their friend and and hear all the horrible things that you've done but they don't hear the what they're saying to the teacher or they don't hear what they're saying to the you know the court system or or things like that so they don't have the the bigger picture. So to them, it kind of just looks like an angry person. And depending on, you know, we, we've all had friends like that who are just angry and upset and they just need to vent. And that's, that's okay to do with your friends. Um, but what happens is that it just, it, it's never ending. And it's also a lot of like bashing versus things like saying I'm hurt, things like saying I'm upset or I'm scared. That's one thing versus like bashing a person's character. And it looks like a lot of like venom filled hatred. So why do people with narcissistic personality disorder do this? So it is really to isolate the person and is a manipulation tactic to discredit them. Um, so, so there's three main reasons that I always like to talk about. Um, number one is like what we call like the the playing the victim. And that is the person who, who usually who seems angry and the person who seems angry, the person who seems vindictive, the person who does a lot of like bashing and yelling and, and maybe not necessarily yelling, but a lot of like bashing and and like really critical and, and just seems angry and mean. 
um you know th that person can seem uh they're kind of taking like that victim role of like this is what they did to me that kind of stuff um the next thing that we talk about um are is the 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 projection so that is when the person is saying things um like oh you know they're, they're cruel and they're that's when you'll see a lot of um people with narcissistic traits um calling their ex a narcissist it's very common um it's that projection um it's like you know i I'm seeing traits in you that I have in myself. Um, that's very common. And then the third one is um, the playing, what we call playing the hero. And that is the person who's, you know, I'm just really worried about him. He shouldn't be around the children or like saying to the teacher, usually like teachers or, or social workers who come out will, will get that side of the person, the, the playing the, the hero. Oh, well, I just, I just don't think she should be around the children. I, I, I think that she's dangerous. You know, she's really been drinking a lot. I'm really worried about her. Like those kind of things. Like I'm, I'm going to play the hero. I'm going to play the savior. I'm just trying to save everyone. I'm trying to save the children. I'm trying to save her from her, herself, that kind of stuff. And then the courts often, I mean, I, I work so often in, in the court system um, supporting survivors and the court system, a lot of times the judge is, is sitting there and you can see them kind of going, huh? You know, they don't know what's going on. They don't know what's who's projecting, who's just angry, who's who's upset versus who's telling the truth, out of, you know, who's what's desperation versus, you know, angry, a angry revenge. I mean, a lot of times the judges are just kind of like, huh? You know, and I, I do think you know, of course, we need a lot of family court reform. But I, I do think a lot of times the courts like they, they're kind of like, huh like you know the even the police they don't know who's who's a victim who's who's a perpetrator and things like that it was very common so when it comes to handling a smear campaign uh what are the tips that you give clients so number one thing i want to say to people is choose your battles do not react to everything that you hear because you will hear a lot and again you hearing a small percentage of of what it is that they're saying, I promise you. Um, so some of the stuff that will trickle down to you will either be stuff that has to come to you because it was filed by a formal authority, such as a court system um, or things like that. Um, but the things that you do here, pick your battles. Um, if it has to do with your children and the safety of your children, that's a battle you should pick. If it has to do with your employment, that's a battle you should pick. If it's just like, oh, well, you know, he's a jerk or, you know, she's over dramatic just you have to find a way to really um filter that out use your support system use your other other areas and other ways of really getting those feelings out besides reacting because you cannot defend yourself to every accusation and you can't go back to the person and tell them to stop um it'll just make it worse it'll it really will fuel the fire um other than that i have um a few tips that I like to to use with people. Um, we talk about things like gray rocking, we talk about things like low contract versus no contact. And then I have a thing, uh, a tip that I use with my clients called NEB techniques, which is N-E-B for N is for necessary, E is for emotionless, and B is for brief. And that is um, especially if you have to have any kind of shared contact with them, like maybe there's shared custody or business assets or or you're going through like a long drawn out court battle, things like that. So making sure that um, the communication with them and any of their affiliates, so whether it's them, their lawyer, their family, friends, is is the communication necessary? Is it emotionless? And is it brief? You know, you, you can keep it professional. Um, you know, it, is it necessary? What I mean by that is if they send you a message about the children and what time you're picking them up, that's necessary to respond to. But if they send you a message about like the outfit that you wore to court today and how it was unflattering, just ignore that. So your book came out today. Yes. And it's called, it's not high conflict. It's post separation abuse. So tell everyone what's in this uh, book and how they will find it useful. Absolutely. So, um, you know, any of us who've, who've been through the court system, you know, the court system frequently labels any kind of divorce or any kind of um, breakup or split where there's a lot of um, animosity, a lot of court filings, a lot of custody battles or things like that. F courts frequently label those as high conflict divorce or high conflict breakup. 
And so my title, it's not high conflict, it's post-separation abuse is because as I've been working with so many of these survivors, so many of these victims, I find myself in my head constantly saying, it's not high conflict. It's not high conflict. This is abuse. So that's where the title came from. Um, the book is, is about, it takes place um, about a, uh, it takes place in Maine um, and it, and it's, um, which is originally where I'm from. And it's about a uh, divorce and there's a child custody battle um, taking place with the divorce. And so the the person, she, she happens to be a female. Her name's Rory. She's trying to um, just trying to end a relationship that, that's just not working for her. Um, he, he was abusive towards her, but she was like, look, I just want to get out of this relationship. However, what happens is it then turns into um, him trying to uh, retaliate against her for leaving. And so the thing that means the most to her, of course, are her her child and her job. And so you can see a lot of, um, you know, I'm not do, do too many spoiler alerts, but a lot of, you know, ways of tactics of him trying to affect that, of him trying to really punish her by using um, lots of um, subpoenas for child custody and stuff like that. So in the book, you know, there's this story that's kind of weaving through and it's really, it's, it's not alive. It's not a person. It's not a client. It's not a true story. It's really a case vignette. That's a representation of, of, all of my clients and all of all of us survivors who have been through this it's kind of just a representation of so many experiences um and through the book as the story is weaving you see her kind of going in and out of the court system and, and trying to get help and just kind of begging like why is it that nobody will help me and nobody will see what's going on she keeps getting everything dismissed as like you know just run-of-the-mill uh high conflict you know judges are just kind of you know, look, this is both of you. And she's saying, no, this is not me. I just need help. So as it kind of weaves through, I have like a lot of tips, a lot of tools, um, things like how to, like what to bring to court. Now, of course, I always like to give the disclaimer. It's, it's not legal advice, but it's um, as someone who has supported survivors and someone who is a survivor, like these things that help in court. So things to bring to court, what type of documentation, how to document. Um, a lot of clients, you know, will have conversations of should you hire a lawyer? Should you not? Um, what does that look like? So there's a lot of tools, a lot of tips, just a lot of like empowering ways um, for survivors who are really navigating like that post-separation abuse um, through the courtroom. And do you have any parting words for everyone in our community? So my parting words that I want to say to people, um, I know it might seem unbelievable. And I know it might seem like I'm kind of just giving you a lot of baloney, but it does eventually get better. Um, I know in the moment it seems like you're, you know, walking, you know, five miles in the snow uphill and you're unable to get out of the situation and it's just coming at you maybe from from every angle and every avenue. Things do eventually get better. Um, focus on yourself, focus on your family, your children, whatever means a lot to you, focus inward and really work on, you know, your, yourself and, and just putting one foot in front of the other every day. And eventually it, it does get a little bit better. Well, Katie Gillis, I want to thank you for being a guest on our show. All of your information will be in our show notes. So just a really big thank you for being here with us today and uh, sharing your knowledge and helping everyone in our community. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad that you're talking about this topic. It's really important. Well, thank you. And if you want to be a guest on our Survivor Story episodes, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page. Please do read all of the instructions that are there. And either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our guest form and press the submit button. And please do read all of the instructions and send it in the format that we ask for. Also at our website, we have a support group. So at the top of the page at NarcissistApocalypse.com, there's a button that says support group. When you click on that button, it takes you to our support group page. There you'll see that we have Zoom meetings every Wednesday night, Thursday afternoons, and Saturday nights. We also have forum boards for you to post on. 
for you to get the validation that you need for whatever's going on in your relationship or possibly with your family as well. Could be a work situation too. And you can also validate the experience of other survivors on there. It is a great group of people on there. So please do join our support group today if you need support. And if you need even more support, please do visit our friends at DomesticShelters.org. And at DomesticShelters.org, they have articles and resources to help you make sense of what you're going through. And they have every phone number, every email address, and every web address for shelters and agencies, no matter how big or small your town is. DomesticShelters.org has it there, and it is a free resource. And that is it for today. So for myself and Katie Gillis, We hope you have a good night.